The National Museum of the U.S. Air Force is opening a new exhibit titled Women in the Air Force. Part of that exhibit will feature women in combat to include Heather Penny, who was given orders on 9-11 to take to the skies in one of two F-16s to stop United Airlines Flight 93 as it headed towards Washington, D.C. We are honored to be interviewing Heather Penny today. Thank you for joining us today, Heather. Oh, thank you. So, so I'm no longer an F-16 pilot. I'm kind of a washed up has-been. It's been a while since I've had any kind of landing currency. Um, but you know, once a, once a fighter pilot, always a fighter pilot. And uh, it, there's a, a saying in the fighter world that the first jet you fly will always be your true love. And, and that certainly is true. Not a day go by, goes by that I don't miss that jet. What inspired you to join the Air Force? I wanted to be a fighter pilot. My father was a fighter pilot and I grew up around um, his, I grew up around his squadron, around the bros, uh, around that community. I listened to their stories. Um, I listened to their flying stories. It, they, were, they were these adventure stories that, that were both thrilling, but meaningful, fun, um, yet hard. And I just couldn't imagine doing anything cooler with my life. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, um, when I got to college, I, that was when I first realized that girls could be fighter pilots. You know, my mom had always brought me up that I could do anything if I just put my mind to it, if I tried hard and if I worked hard enough. And I actually don't think my dad took me seriously enough. I didn't really blame them. I was a teenager, right? Teenagers are, you know, kind of all over the place. Um, and so he just never really bothered to tell me. And so when I got to college and I realized that, uh, that women could not be fighter pilots, my life ended up taking a different direction. And I thought that I was going to go into academia. Um, when I was in graduate school, this is when I learned that Congress had uh, changed the law to allow women to fly in combat. So they'd remove that combat exclusion <laughs> for female aviators. I mean, clearly that combat exclusion it continued to persist for well over another 20 years um, for women on the ground. But that opened the door for me. And because I wanted to be a fighter pilot and I, my father had gone from the Air Force into the Air National Guard, I knew that if I applied to the Air National Guard that I would have some more control over my life um, and what platform I would fly after that. Now, I really just wanted to fly and I wanted to fly fighters. Um, so what I did was I applied to all the fighter units uh, across the Air National Guard across the nation, and I was fortunate enough to be hired by the D.C. Air National Guard. How many years were you with the Guard? So I was with the Guard for 16 years, and then I transitioned over to the Reserves for, uh, for my final, uh, final several years. Since you come from an Air Force family, what did you think about what did they think about your choice to pursue the aviation career field? We already touched on it, but um, did they ever, can you go further into that? <laughs> they were thrilled. They were just thrilled. Um, my mom um, has always been one of my greatest supporters and my father um, was just delighted. He was, it was something that um, I don't know that he, he felt like he could ever hope for, but he was so, so proud of me. At the same time, though, I have to be honest, um, as supportive as he was, he also had a lot of concern over me going into um, what he knew was a very male dominated um, environment and culture. And so he, he worried about me um, and he worried about my ability to fit in, my ability to succeed. And it wasn't because he doubted me and my abilities. I think, to be honest, he was caught in that tension, that cusp between the old, sort of the old culture, which we all recognize that heritage was hyper-masculine. Um, I mean, it was a boys club and, and he thrived in that and, and as part of our heritage. And there are reasons why it evolved that way. Um, but, but that wasn't, you know, that, that wasn't me. I wasn't a guy. I wasn't a dude. I could never actually be part of the boys club. And so I think that that, that tension where I, while he was supportive of me and he believed in my abilities and he was very proud of me, um, that tension always, uh, I, I was aware of that um, even going forward. But I have to say that 
over time, one of the things that I have cherished the most is how my service has connected me to my father in a way that I never expected. And it's, it's a bond that we share and that we cherish. What aircraft did you fly during your career? <laughs> well, of course, my favorite was the F-16. <laughs> and not a day goes by, as I said, that I don't miss that jet. And, and miss a mission and miss my bros and miss, you know, I miss the guys on the ground, the expediters, the crew chiefs, the avionics technicians, the engine guys, the weapons guys. Just the way that the entire team comes together in a fighter wing. It's like family. And yeah, it's a little dysfunctional. There's little squabbles here and there, but you're all pulling in the same direction. And you know that everyone else has got your back and you got theirs. So, you know, when I say that uh, I love the F-16, truly, because I mean, you're, that's not a jet that you fly. That's a, that's a jet that you become. You know, you really, when you strap into that jet, you think it, it does it. And I loved the, the intellectual challenge of the tactics, the techniques, the procedures um, of, of understanding how all of the weapon systems worked, why they worked that way, and being able to exploit that level of knowledge in the execution of my tactics and procedures. I mean, that was, I, I describe it to people who haven't experienced it as chess at nine Gs and 500 knots. And I, that was thrilling to me. And I love doing that. And, and you do it with your best friends, right? Um, I, I, I love that. But another, you know, a major reason why I miss that jet as well is just the entire, the culture and the people that surround that. When I left the F-16, I, I had to make that decision because I was a single mom with two little girls and I was also a part-timer too. So I had a full-time job that I was balancing as well. And I'll be honest, I just, I couldn't do it all. Uh, my, my civilian job was demanding. Clearly being a fighter pilot is very demanding. And with the two little girls, which, you know, that's something that, that's a relationship, that's a responsibility, that's a, an obligation, a duty, and a privilege of parenting, that that's something you cannot break. And I knew one of those things was, was going to fall. And unfortunately, what I needed to do was make the decision to leave the F-16. So I was very fortunate when I called the knock it off with my commander at the time <clears throat> uh, that the commander of our sister squadron on the other side of the base with the 201st airlift squadron heard that I was leaving and asked me to come fly with him. So we had a conversation about the reasons why I was leaving the jet because I didn't want to um, have expectations that I couldn't fulfill. And as it turned out, uh, they were very flexible, very accommodating. And moving from the F-16 to the DB airlift mission was exactly the kind of, of relief that I needed to be able to continue to serve, to be able to continue to fly, um, but not at the demand cycle uh, that, the, that the fighter was. And I have to say, first of all, I just love every airplane that I fly. <laughs> you know, people say, "What's your favorite jet?" You know, "What's your favorite airplane?" Well, it's whatever I'm flying that day. But going over to the airlift side was a great opportunity for me to see another side of the Air Force that I had never really been exposed to because I was always in the in the CAF, the Combat Air Forces, um, and so we always thought about um, the mission in in a combat. You know, putting bombs on target on time. So moving over into the airlift world and specifically the DV airlift world, because you know, airlift is a, is a large and diverse community, whether or not it's strat airlift or um, tactical airlift like with C-130s and, and so forth. So we were doing the DV airlift mission and the people in that squadron, the pilots in that squadron had come from all of these diverse airlift communities and they were consummate professionals. Now their tactics, techniques and procedures weren't about putting weapons you know, on target, their tactics and techniques and procedures are all about, you know, instrument flight and routing and the basics of, of aviation. But their professionalism, their precision, their knowledge, their commitment, um, their, their excellence and everything that they did just provided me a huge respect and a knowledge of the different challenges and problem sets that those those missions also have to face. So I loved what I flew over there. I flew a little Astrojet. I always say it's a Gulfstream, right? Because Gulfstream bought the Astrojet. So it's a G100. 
Um, I've, <laughs> it's not a pretty airplane. If you ever take a look at the Astrojet, it kind of looks a little bit like an ugly duckling. <laughs> you know, only its mama could love it. But it was a thrusty little airplane. Um, it really could go fast. We actually could outrun the C-40s um, because our cruise speed was higher and faster uh, than those aircraft. And it, you know, I joke, um, I, you know, I traded a, 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 an ejection seat for a toilet seat. We did actually have a real flushing lab in the back. <laughs> but, um, and I also found that I really loved flying in a crude environment as well. I mean, I do love flying by myself. Um, all of us who are single seat fighter pilots were like, you know, hey, get in the back, go cold mic. Um, no one likes a, a, a backseat driver, but I also really found that um, I, I enjoyed and and really cherished the crew environment as well, working together as a team. Because when and we fly fighters, we always fly as a team as well. You're you never go out as a as a lone wolf. Like the one seventeen did that, but but we don't do that in typical fighters. So you're still always flying as a crew as a team. So when I moved over to the Astrojet, it just happened to be that my my teammate um, was sitting in the jet with me, <laughs> but uh, I, yeah, I just, I just really enjoyed it and loved it. Of course, before any of that cool stuff happened, I flew the T-37 and the T-38 um, training at NJET, and uh, the T-38 is going to be phased out as we bring the T-7 uh, red tail on board. T-37, I was actually one of the last classes to fly the T-37 at NJET. Um, because they were transitioning over to um, uh, the T6, the, the joint uh, uh, pilot um, training system and the JPATs. But it was nice to be able to say that I flew, I flew the tweet, flew the mighty dog whistle, um, especially because again, those two jets were jets that my father had trained in when he was um, a young student going through pilot training. So it was another neat way for us to be able to connect and, 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 a, and a bond that we share. And during your career, did you, you raced airplanes with the, the Reno Air Races? Can you talk about that? <laughs> oh my gosh, I loved racing. I loved racing. Um, so I grew up at the Reno Air Races. My father had, when he left the active duty, um, he had gotten hired by United Airlines and then pretty immediately he had gotten furloughed. And so um, what he ended up doing for the six years that he was furloughed was he started as an engineer on the wing for a small company called Learfan. Now you may remember um, or be familiar with a Learjet. Bill Lear um, designed the Learjet. He also designed the eight track um, uh, tape player and the car radio and another touch, bunch of cool stuff. Well, the Learfan was an all composite uh, turboprop. It was a pusher uh, aircraft and it was incredibly efficient. It really was the first civil application of composite technology. Um, composite technology had been used by the military, but it was the first civil application of it. And so it was really kind of a leading edge technology. And he ended up progressing to becoming um, a member of the, the flight test operations. And when he, when he left Learfan, uh, because he be got recalled by United Airlines, he was their chief test pilot. Now Learfan was based out of Reno Stead Airport. And that's where the Reno Air Races are, the National Championship Air Races. So every year, because it was held on my birthday, like my birthday just happened to coincide with when the races are, um, I would spend, we would spend the entire week at the Reno Air Races. And he actually then um, became involved with the Rare Bear Air Racing Team and became uh, the race pilot for the Rare Bear Air Racing Team. And that was where, I mean, I just really fell in love with the, the sport of air racing because it is competitive formation. It is not, it, it's not just a single aircraft going out and seeing how fast they can go. You have eight aircraft on the track from 50 feet to 250 feet. And there's, there's horizontal limits as well. So you essentially have a 3D corridor that you have to stay within and you're jockeying um, against each other for position to be able to, to win. And so it's a combination of all the energy management that I had learned in dogfighting with, with basic fighter maneuvers in the F-16, um, everything that I had learned about formation flying, but then doing it in a competitive way. Uh, when I left the F-16, I actually was shortly afterwards uh, uh, asked if I would be interested in uh, racing jets. And uh, I, you know, my father had been involved with the Rare Bear, which was a highly modified F-8 Bearcat. 
Um, so he was doing the Unlimiteds, which are basically World War II aircraft that are modified to go faster than they were ever designed to be. Um, the jets, however, obviously um, were jets. And what and they were also, they could be stock, they could be modified. Um, and what was interesting about them is that what comprised most of the competitive field were these ex-Soviet trainers. <laughs> so I flew an L-29, um, which just as kind of a doggy little aircraft uh, with the stock engine, it, I mean, it's an, it's an old, um, it's an old jet engine technology. So you push the throttle forward and you look at your stopwatch and about 12 seconds later, you kind of feel the thrust come in. So stock engine wasn't really fast, but when we put in a new engine, which essentially doubled the thrust uh, of the aircraft, that was a fast, slick little machine. Um, the wings were actually the biggest limitation that we had on the jet in terms of going fast because they were the kind of these fat Hershey bar wings. So we began to um, uh, see some uh, compressive effects from compressibility on the wings as we began to really get towards our race speeds. But uh, just a, a ton of fun, not something that the amateur can do. It really takes a tremendous amount of skill of training. And fortunately, I had gotten all of that um, from the Air Force. So I was able to transfer that over. Um, but just, just a tremendous amount of fun. The, the, the most fun I had since flying the F-16. We recently interviewed the first women to graduate from the Air Force undergraduate pilot training back in 1977. These women broke barriers for other women to serve as pilots in the Air Force. I understand you were the only woman in your UPT class. What experiences or challenges, challenges did you face as a woman during training and later in your career? During training, I have to say, probably the biggest challenge I faced was me. Uh, and it was twofold. One was, I mean, everyone is so competitive. And at the same time, not only we're competitive, but we also work together and collaborate. And um, the, the, the barrier that I faced inside that I had to overcome was my self-doubt. Um, was I good enough to be able to do this? Could I really compete and achieve and meet the standards. And self-doubt, if you get caught up in it, can decrease your performance. So it becomes a self-fulfilling cycle. Getting outside of my head um, and learning to actually not listen to the insecurities and the self-doubt from, uh, you know, from that um, competitive environment was a, a crucial tool that I had to master and learn to really be able to blossom and, and grow in pilot training. But the other piece of it too, was that being the only female there, um, which did feed some of that self-doubt, um, was that I didn't really understand how to fit in. Um, I had a thick skin. Um, we all cared tremendously about what we did. So we all took it very seriously, um, you know, any, any issues or, or you know, when you had feedback or you failed, you know, you hooked a ride or so forth. I mean, clearly we all took that very seriously, but fitting in with the culture and I had never been in group sports. I hadn't played a lot with, uh, you know, done, hadn't been involved with uh, uh, varsity sports in high school. And so although I, I could do some, you know, I, what I, I really faced a challenge fitting in and I could have used more mentorship and understanding how to integrate because it was something we were all trying to figure out. And so I didn't really do it very well. Um, the guys in my squadron were they you know, they're pretty good. They, 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 but they were also figuring out too. So it was awkward and there were some, definitely some, some less than graceful moments on, on everyone's part. When I was in pilot training, there was an, a female instructor pilot who was in the flight next to me and everyone just thought the world of her. She was well known to be one of the best instructor pilots on the entire base. She had been an incredibly just awesome uh, fighter pilot before she had come uh, in, to, the, uh, to, uh, uh, to pilot training to become an instructor pilot. And, and she was a great mentor. Uh, she was in this flight next to me and I talked to, the, to my bros and they were like, oh, she's awesome she wouldn't mentor me. 
And it wasn't just that I wasn't in her flight. I mean, like if we were walking down the hall, she didn't acknowledge that I existed. If I ran into her in the, in the ladies room, there was no, there wasn't even like a, Hey, how's it going? You doing okay? Um, there was, there was no role modeling, no kind of guidance, um, you know, no coaching, no mentoring. And that made it even more difficult for me to try to figure out how to navigate and fit in and be part of the club, be part of the group. What was a real game changer for me. And I, I mean, I, and I watched her. So I did, I did actually watch this instructor pilot to try to see what worked and what didn't. Um, and, and how she was able to be so successful. So I did try to pattern some of my behaviors and learn from what I could observe, what little I could, could observe. But what was a real game changer for me was there was another woman in um, another student pilot who was, uh, I'd say four, five classes ahead of me in pilot training. And she was amazing. She reached out to me and she's like, hey, you know, at the time my call sign was Skippy. Um, hey, Skippy, how you doing? You know, is, how's everything going? And she would give me some of the gouge and she'd tell me like, oh, I had this check ride. Here's what it was like. And oh, I just had this, this, you know, I just did this and hey, don't do that. And, and remember to do this. And so she, she really coached me, not just in um, the, the challenges that we all faced, being student pilots, learning how to fly, um, learning how to fly formation, doing the low levels, all the knowledge stuff. So she coached me on that stuff, but more importantly, her, her support, her emotional support, and the fact that she was willing to like reach down and connect with me really gave me the, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to figure this out. We're, we're all going to be good. And what I learned from her um, is that, you know, when you when looking back on, on, on our time in pilot training, being the four or five classes ahead of me, she was really, she, she wasn't that much further, right? Um, but at the time, it felt like she was, she was in the T-38 while I was in the T-37, like, oh, ah, she was amazing. Um, it just, it taught me that as I look back, it's never too early give a hand up to support someone who's coming behind you. Often we wait in our careers um, to feel like we've arrived, like we have something to give, like we have to be somebody important before we can mentor someone behind us. We have to be somebody, you know, we have to be a big deal. We have to be a leader. We have to be a commander before we can be a mentor. And that's just not the case at all. Sometimes just having someone who's close to you, who's just a little bit ahead of you and is able to reach back they, that mentorship, that mutual support, um, that coaching can mean the difference between failure and success. And so this, this, this the, the student pilot who was ahead of me, uh, Christine um, Callahan, now Christine uh, Grinder Mao, uh, became the first F-35 pilot, female F-35 pilot. Um, and she, even to this day, we're very close. And I continue to admire how she always tries to reach out and support and, and coach and mentor everyone who's around her, you know, male, you know, female or male, right? Um, but it's just, it's never too early to give back. Your call sign is Lucky. Can you tell us how you came by that name? And tell me more about Skippy too. <laughs> well, so um, in pilot training, uh, we got our call signs after our, um, after our first solo. So after everyone soloed, we'd have a party and we would all tell stories on each other. And uh, I'm not at liberty to tell the story of how I got the name Skippy, but I'll just say it was a very good story. And I would say less than 10% of it was true, <laughs> but it was a good call sign. Um, when I got to my fighter squadron, one thing you have to remember about uh, call signs is that you don't get to pick your call sign. And call signs are generally not pretty cool um, I'm very fortunate. I've got a great call sign, um, but it's usually either a play off your last name, like mine, Lucky Penny. So it's play off your last name. Um, it's because you committed some act of buffoonery, did something stupid, did something funny. Uh, so it's a story related to that. Or um, the other thing that people love are acronyms. 
so connected to the did something funny, stupid, um, et cetera, is that that can then become an acronym. But we all try to filter our names through what we call um, the red flag test. So can you stand up at the stage at red flag and say, hi, I'm Lucky Penny and you know, look like you're somebody who could go be a mission commander. Uh, so, so there's, there's, there are some rituals and, and um, rules about kind of the names uh, that, that we can earn. Uh, but the thing that's important is that it's, it's a moment of becoming. It's a rite of passage. And that's why our names matter so much to us, because you don't get a name just when you show up. You have to become combat mission ready before you are are before you've earned your name. And that time frame not only gives a squadron time to know who you are, what you're about, um, you know, get, you know, everyone's getting to know each other. And plus, obviously, you have to have some material for your name too. But that time frame is when you're earning your combat mission qualification. If if your unit were to go off to war before you are CMR combat mission ready, you don't get to go with them. You're not a full up round. And so that rite of passage, um, which is a mission check ride, and it's a massive ground evaluation that you do in front of the entire squadron. It is, um, it is one of the most stressful things that I had ever done in my life uh, up until that point. And so it's a real moment of acceptance of becoming one of the tribe of, of reaching this, this crucial moment that you've been working for for years. Uh, so it's it really has so many deep meanings and our call signs represent that. So as I said, you know, my call sign is, you know, Lucky Penny. Uh, it's a play off my last name, but I also was honestly really lucky when I was going through all my um, uh, combat training at the fighter squadron before it became uh, combat mission ready uh, because I got to um, go on a, a, a winter deployment to um, Key West, fly some Hornets. Um, we, you know, we went to, uh, you know, we, we, we just did a lot of stuff that were, it was on the schedule for the squadron. So my timing just happened to be impeccable. Um, so, so there was lucky there, like she was really lucky. Um, but I think probably what captures it most is better lucky than good, <laughs> which is an old fighter pilot saying, cause there's always someone better than you. So it's better to be lucky than good. How long had you served in the Air Force prior to the mission on September 11th, 2001? So I had, I had sworn in in um, August of 97 and then went off to uh, pilot training um, in August of 99. So I had kind of been um, in, in the service for a little while, but really not that long. And I had only gotten back to my fighter squadron there at DC um, late December, early January. I became a uh, CMR uh, combat mission ready in March of that year. So I was still very new. 